have the opportunity to be here with you to ask the world to stop its silence in the face of oppression. So as we gather here today, we gather to say to the world that Iran will be free. Thank you. President Nelson Mandela said, there is no easy walk to freedom anywhere. And many of us will have to pass through the valley of the shadow of death again and again before we reach the mountaintop of our desires. However, we have to ask the world how many must die? We have to ask the world how many parents must bury their children? We have to ask the world how many siblings must beg for the bodies of their brothers to bury before the world says enough. The silence of those who assured the safety of the refugees in Ashraf and Liberty is going to end. And we are here today to make sure that that happens. We have an amazing group of people to give voice to that opposition. And we will start with the former mayor of New York, Mayor Rudolph Giuliani. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It is very difficult to speak after witnessing the atrocities uh, that we just saw. I said some time ago at a gathering similar to this that Camp Liberty wasn't a relocation camp, it was a concentration camp. It's an extermination camp. That's what it's become. It's not just a concentration camp, it's become an extermination camp under the auspices of the United Nations and the United States. How awful is that? How terrible is that? if we, we want to assuage our consciences at all. This is a very, very critical time. It's a critical time for the people of Ashraf and Liberty and for their safety and survival. That's very concrete, that's very real. We can feel the danger to them, can't we? We can feel that their lives are at great risk who knows what Maliki will do? Who knows what the Ayatollahs and the Mullahs will want him to do? So we're here at a time in which the survival of these people who are listening to us, when we had a great opportunity with the leverage that we had to get an agreement that would push back on there being a nuclear power. Please. When the history of this is written, people have to remember that this organization that Madame Rajavi runs, that many of you are part of and have supported, it wasn't just the sanctions that helped bring about this possibility of an agreement that could have been a valid one. It was the work of the MEK. Are we ever going to learn anything from history? Or are we constantly going to just keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again? They did this to the us before. They fooled us like this before. They made jerks out of, out of us like this before. And Rouhani has written it in his book bragging about it. God. 
naive can you be? How naive can you be? Gosh, maybe you can be as naive as Chamberlain was when he refused to read or take Hitler's Mein Kampf seriously. Rouhani fooled us once before. They pretended they were going to cease nuclear enrichment. They pretended they were going to stop building any more centrifuges. They pretended they were going to comply with the inspections. And they got caught cheating. Who caught them? Did the UN catch them? Did the US catch them? Did the UK or France catch them? MEK caught them. As the, world, as the world was moving on in this romantic notion that we can negotiate with Iran, everything will be fine, let's sing a few songs and the nuclear weapons will disappear. It was your work that in August of 2002 revealed nuclear sites at Natanz and Iraq. You brought that knowledge to the world. That began to crush this phony act on the part of the Iranian regime. And then in 2005, you revealed a site in central Iran under a mountain, deep under a mountain in Fordo, that would allow Iran to enrich uranium and maybe be protected against bombings. It was your work, and I just mentioned two, it was your work that put the lie to what Iran was saying or doing. And Rouhani, in his book, in his memoirs, says, that at least they got a couple of good years of fooling us. While we were thinking they weren't doing anything, they were moving straight ahead to becoming a nuclear power. So when you negotiate with someone who has cheated you before, someone who has fooled you before, there are certain things that you have to put into it to protect yourself. The first thing that shouldn't happen, we shouldn't link together and I fear my government does this, negotiating with the Iranian regime and abandoning our promises to the people of Ashraf and Liberty. These two things are not connected. But I believe in the mind of my government, I believe in the mind of my State Department, these two things are connected. They believe that if they fight too hard to help the people of Liberty and Ashraf, it will undermine these negotiations. First of all, maybe it would be a good thing if we undermine these negotiations. Maybe it would be a good thing if these negotiations started to have some reality built into them. Maybe it would be a good thing if we stood up to Iran and we said, yes, we want you to be nuclear free. Yes, we are willing to make concessions, realistic ones, for nuclear freedom. No nuclear weapons in Iran. But I tell you what we're not going to do. We're not going to allow you to slaughter people that we promise to protect just to get some kind of possibly useless agreement. Maybe, maybe if we stood up to them and maybe if we said, stop slaughtering innocent people in Iraq, stop slaughtering innocent people in Iran, and as you continue to do that, we will not speak to you. And if you continue to do that, you see those sanctions, we'll double them and we'll crush you. Maybe if we spoke to them like that, they would respect us. They would respect the United States of America. You do not, you do not become a supplicant to bullies. The history of the world is replete with examples of what happens to nations, even great ones, that become supplicants to bullies. What you do with bullies is you stand up to them.
So I conclude with four recommendations. First, and most important, we must uphold our promise. We must keep our promise. There's only one way to keep our promise. The one way to keep our promise is to send American planes to Iraq and take every one of those people who are, I believe, in line for being killed, put them on an airplane and bring them to the United States of America. And then maybe my country can have its honor back again. On the nuclear issue, if there ever is a final agreement, there must be inspections without notice. Third, under no circumstances should we accept the legitimacy of the Iranian regime. How can we? How can we? We overthrew Mubarak. We overthrew Gaddafi. We want to overthrow Assad. You're telling me this regime in Iran is any different than those three? In fact, it's much worse than those three. In fact, it's a much bigger enemy of my country than those three. In fact, it's killed many more Americans than those three combined. What kind of foreign policy can we have? What kind of respect in the world can we have? What kind of consistency can we have in the message we're giving the world if we believe that everything has to be done to overthrow Mubarak, Gaddafi, and Assad, but keep the Ayatollah in power. We cannot accept regime change. We cannot accept the legitimacy of a regime who in the last hundred days, or let's say the first hundred days of the reformers regime, has killed over 400 people. They're still murderers. They're still killers. They're not just attempting to kill the people of Camp Liberty, they're killing their own people. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten a day under the reformer. Wake up! And finally, America should recognize that there is a democratic alternative to the regime in Iran. It exists. It's real. It has enormous support. It's gained credibility by the blood of its martyrs. And that alternative is the MEK. Recognizing that will put tremendous pressure. Recognizing that, recognizing that will put tremendous pressure on the Iranian regime. And more important than the Iranian regime, it will give hope to the people of Iran who desperately need hope. All of us, all of us are seriously concerned. All of us are there to help. But the people most affected are the people at Liberty. And I say to them directly, you're not alone. You're not forgotten. And your sacrifices will be the building blocks on which your great peoples and your once great nation will get reestablished. And you will be the heroes of the future. Under Madame Rajavi's leadership, I know that everything will be done to deliver you. And that the freedom you achieve for your people is going to happen. It's a long road. It's a dangerous road. It's a road that others have traveled. But when the idea of freedom is alive, when it has this kind of support, when it has a determined leader like Madame Rajavi, and when it has people who are willing to die for it, freedom prevails and it will for Iran. Thank you and God bless you.